going up to the board here, you can see in the year 1850, this was actually when processed flour became widely available. Now, when I say widely available, that's the key word here, because before this, um, there was a lot less grain available for the average household, at least to the quantities that we have today. Now understand that in today's world, today's metric, 50% of total calories are from wheat. Wheat alone. Now this was not true in 1850, and so it's important to understand this perspective as we, as we walk through the history tonight. So again, this, this new processing of flour allows for widespread use of grain. And so five years later, we get Dr. Gull Guy starting to report descriptions of gluten intolerance and gluten sensitivity. So again, we introduce this processed flour. Five years later, we get a doctor saying, hey, we're seeing signs. Um, of a problem here. So warning bells are going off. Now fast forward, we go into 1892 and you have the shredded wheat machine invention. So William Henry Ford and Henry Drussel Perkey invent a machine that shreds whole wheat and they start producing shredded wheat in mass. So again, this is, we have widely available processed grain, but now we have widely available processed packaged breakfast cereal and this is so this is when we really get breakfast cereal coming to the stage now many of you grew up with uh, the idea that breakfast cereal was you know what how what do they how do they put it part of a balanced diet right that's what we heard time and time again why part of a balanced diet because breakfast cereal is not a balanced diet it's part of a balanced diet. And if you ever notice in those cereal commercials, they always had other food around the bowl of cereal. And this is the reason why is that it, it was very well known that breakfast cereal or cereals in general were very poor in nutrition. And so they had to use this terminology. They couldn't say breakfast cereal is a balanced diet. They had to say part of a balanced diet. And so we all grew up, we, we kind of subliminally put this part out of our mind and what we really actually heard, this is the marketing genius behind some of these guys, is that we really just heard balanced diet. And so in our mind, what that did is it reinforced the necessity, in a sense, to actually eat grain in greater degrees. But again, we can think the same man who revolutionized the car industry, Henry Ford, for creating the, the first shredded wheat machine that made cereal widely available. So that's 1892, and we fast forward a couple years. So again, fast forward to 1894, and then we have Dr. John Kellogg creating cornflakes. He did that with his brother, and so now we have the next cereal you know, making its way onto the scene, cornflakes. And then we have, by 1897, and what's interesting about this is C.W. Post, who I believe was a patient of Dr. John Kellogg, and so he was so impressed by these cornflakes that it you know, convinced him that he needed to get in on this and create grape nuts, which is ironic because grape nuts neither has grapes or nuts in it. Um, it's a processed, fully processed grain-based food that you have to soak or it'll rip a hole in the roof of your mouth. But again, invented in 1897 by C.W. Post. And so you'll recognize these two names, Post Cereal Company and Kellogg Cereal Company, both dominant forces in the processed cereal scene. And then 1922, you know, after we've got, now we've got shredded wheat, we've got cornflakes, and we've got grape nuts, we have uh, another really smart doctor, Dr. Robert McCarrison. He starts warning his medical colleagues about the increase in intestinal diseases that he's seeing. So we have this kind of corollary now. And some of you will say, well, well correlation is not causation. I don't disagree. but. Uh, it's very interesting that he's making this correlation shortly after um, wide availability of processed cereals become kind of the standard. And then in 1931, another very brilliant doctor by the name of Dr. Willem Dick, or Dickey, he, he starts experimenting with wheat-free diets in kids with celiac disease. And you have to remember at the time, we didn't know 
what caused celiac disease. So he was very much a revolutionary pioneer because he's the one who actually made the correlation and figured it out that celiac was a manifestation of gluten, um, but, but he started out with wheat-free diets as part of that. Now what's interesting about, about this gentleman, we'll, we'll talk about here in just a minute because he made some great observations during World War II as well. And then we have just a year later in 1932, many of you have heard of Crohn's disease, it's an intestinal inflammatory disease, sometimes referred to as regional ileitis, but B.B. Crohn, Dr. B.B. Crohn, right, he identifies a new intestinal disorder, and we say new in quotation uh, marks because it's new. This doesn't exist prior this time frame. So linked to grain consumption, now it's known as Crohn's disease, but originally it was called um, regional ileitis. So again, another disease of intestinal inflammation. So we've got several doctors here starting to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And then we get into the 1940s. And then we throw in a major curveball in the 1940s. What's that curveball? That curveball is chemical fertilizers. Now, I want to point out, and I want to back up for just a minute, this is before chemical fertilizers, right? So these guys are recognizing that processed cereal grain is causing intestinal inflammation and intestinal disease before the advent of all of these commercial fertilizers. Now, what was true of this time frame before those commercial uh, chemicals is we had um, a couple of really smart guys. Haber Bosch created nitrogen fixation, and this was... Um, this was really, they, they really started to, to stumble on this and really ramp it up in around the 19, early 1900s, around 1908. And it was really through, I think 1913, don't quote me on that date exactly, but, so this is where nitrogen fertilizer, this is what gave us the ability to start producing high levels of fertilizer because before this time, the world was running out of poop, and I mean that literally, like the world population was growing at such a fast pace that farming couldn't keep up with the food demand, and there wasn't enough poop. Remember, poop is what we use for fertilizer, and so they were, they, there's this whole history behind collecting poop. Countries were collecting poop from everywhere they could. We, we ravaged all the bat poop uh, and bird poop from South America for years. We, we were taking um, just big, big caches of, of collective poop, right? And we were shipping that all over the world to use as fertilizers because this stuff worked very well. So again, we were running out of the ability to keep up with the demand to, to feed the population. And these brilliant scientists, Haber and Bosch, created nitrogen fixation from air. And so this is how we came for nitrogen fertilizer. And so when this really began to hit the scene, and this is where chemistry really starts to take off, is now we have chemical fertilizers being added to increase crop yields and to grow things. Um, but you gotta remember that when you add these chemical fertilizers, you increase the yield. This is what this does is increases the quantity of the grain that you can grow, but it also um, speeds things up. So it, it makes them bigger and it increases quantity. So what you're ending up with is you're ending up with more product or more grain with less nutrients. So this is just one more problem, even bef you know, but even before this was happening, and again, I'm, I'm trying to be very clear with you, before this was happening, we were still seeing intestinal inflammatory diseases coming on the scene. So again, we've got farmers using chemical fertilizers, increasing yields, reducing nutrients in grain and other crops, and then you know, right after the Great Depression, which, which ended approximately uh, in the late 1930s, early 1940s, government takes over and they start to take away, they start to set aside tax dollars, okay, to give to the farming industry to grow more corn, soy, wheat, um, and, and other seed-based, uh, processed seed-based crops. Um, and so we get this whole agribiz that comes out of government subsidies. And I say agribiz because the, the, the reason that what we are all told in, in some of the history books is the reason the government subsidized grain was to prevent farmers from going out of business. But the actuality is, is that the Great Depression had already put a lot of farmers out of business. And so this is where we had big companies coming in and buying out farms.
before the subsidies ever set in. So the subsidies actually benefited these big companies that bought the farmland from the bankrupt farmers as a result of the Great Depression. And so who were, who were we really giving that money to? We were giving that money to these companies that were now growing with heavy chemical fertilizers, right? Reducing the nutritional quality of the food. And, um, and so again, we were focusing all the dollars on growing monocropping. And so this is really where monocropping began. Heavy, heavy, large swaths of land, acres and acres of land, thousands of acres of land were being used to grow predominantly just a handful of different types of crops. And again, this is in the early 40s. And then in 1943, we get this processed grain ban, which is a very interesting part of history. If you've ever picked up um, a, a loaf of bread or a box of cereal, you'll flip it over, you can see on the back it says fortified with, right? That terminology, fortified with. And then you'll see a list of different nutrients. And typically what you see are thiamine, niacin, you'll see iron and other nutrients, folate nowadays, of, or actually folic acid, which is synthetic folate. Um, but what happened in 1943 is the U.S. government actually banned the sale of processed grains unless they were fortified with these nutrients, with these select vitamins and minerals. And so, and the reason why, what was the reason why? It was because, oh, it was around 8,000 deaths every year were being caused by grain, by processed grain. And how so, it was, they were causing diseases like beriberi, which is vitamin B1 deficiency, and pellagra, which is a niacin or vitamin B3 deficiency. And so people were dying, thousands of people were dying annually from the utilization of, of processed cereal and grain-based products. And so the government said, from now on, if you're gonna sell it, you gotta fortify it uh, because of that. So, What's interesting here is we have, again, cereal is taking off and now it's killing people and now the government says you have to fortify it. And so what happens next is the cereal industry says, okay, we're going to fortify it. And they do. They start fortifying. And instead of saying, hey, you know, don't eat this cereal because it's really not a nutritious food and it's responsible for causing malnutrition and killing people. They were really brilliant at marketing, and what they said instead is eat more of us, right? Eat more because now we're fortified. Now we're part of a balanced breakfast. Again, that's where that phraseology comes from. And you can see um, uh, as, as the cereal history, as, as commercials got more and more aggressively pointed at kids, and especially as it, as it relates to the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, at least in the 1940s. So if you look in the early 1940s, if you can blow up right here, it says posts sugar crisp, right? So, so for snacks, it's so handy. And then down here, what you can't see in this is, or it's like candy. So at least in this advertisement, they were honest. They were saying it's like candy, so they were being honest with it. Today, so many parents are buying these sugary cereals for their children and they're calling it part of a balanced breakfast or in their mind, they're thinking that it's part of a balanced breakfast. They're not thinking it's candy, but in reality is if you're eating these types of cereals, basically you're eating candy um, for breakfast. And you know, candy's not breakfast food, shouldn't be, right? So again, 1945, following World War II, we got cereal companies now starting to target ads toward children. And these were the three sugar bears for the, for the sugar, what have ultimately became sugar smacks. And, and the three bears became one, if you remember that particular bear when you were growing up. And then, so fast forward from the 40s into the 50s. Now we have the same doctor I mentioned earlier, Dr. Willem Dickey. He publishes an article based on his doctoral thesis linking wheat proteins, particularly linking gluten, damage to the mucosal lining of the intestine. And what happened was very interesting because as he was during World War II, he was treating kids in the hospitals and what happened was grain rationing. So grain was rationed and he noticed a trend in the kids with celiac disease that they would get better. So they would improve, patients would improve without grain. 
And so uh, he's observing this entire decade of, of research and he publishes his thesis in 1953 and that becomes, uh, that becomes scientific knowledge and history.